So uh, welcome everybody. This is a podcast that the purpose of this podcast is to uh, foster pro-social behavior. And we're going to discuss all sorts of different topics and uh, bring it always back around to how we can foster pro-social behavior because we see that as uh, fundamental to uh, human survival. And um, one of the main ways to do that is to talk about, um, to raise awareness about fundamental human needs. And uh, we're going to talk a bit about that in every episode. And so while it's really exciting for us to uh, to, to start this, um, this is something that we've been wanting to do for uh, for years now. And uh, finally, we're, we're giving it, it a go. So today, the episode is mostly going to be focused on uh, artificial intelligence, and we're going to just discuss different points together. Um, and please let us know if you have any opinions or comments about what we talk about. Uh, tell us in the comments below. Well, sorry, I, I would first, I guess, suppose we should uh, introduce ourselves first. So I, I'm Marcus Packard. I'm a president of the Pro Socialized Foundation. And so that's why we're working on fostering pro social behavior. That's what we do as a as a um, as a foundation, and uh, my co-host is uh, Pal Packard. Yep, <laughs> um, I am. I, um, I I'm, I'm involved in education. I teach. I used to uh, do research in neuroscience, and um, I also um, participate uh, and help uh, mark us out with uh, his uh, company and his uh, foundation. I think what's very interesting uh, to keep in mind is that you have a doctorate in neuroscience, uh, mm-hmm. and then you you also uh, got a postdoc in correct in Germany. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, I, yeah, I have a PhD in in um, psychology and neuroscience, and I did uh, research uh, several years in uh, in, on, in neuroscience and psychology and in, in, uh, about memory um, in. Um, in Germany and also in Barcelona. Uh, my background, I have like a, an education in engineering and uh, electrical engineering, and uh, but I didn't practice it very long. I, I did uh, work in that for a few years, but um, uh, very quickly I um, I realized that uh, I had to dedicate my life to fostering pro-social behavior and exactly how to do that. I've been uh, learning over, yeah, I don't know, something like 15 years now. Um, so that's, that's my specialty now. Um, and I'm also, um, I'm also specialized in, uh, cryptocurrency and uh, web three as well, but that's not really relevant, relevant here. Um, so one of the things that I was interesting is that, uh, I find interesting. So when we've been looking at, right, we've been looking at, we've been, we've been following different people, um, that talk a lot about AI, right? Um, and they have, there's, there's opposing takes, you know, some people believe that it, um, that it, it, we will for sure, uh, we will for sure be all killed by AI, right? So that's like the, the take of, uh, like Eliza Bukowski, um, he's somewhat famous for that. And then there are others that are very, um, that are accelerationists, right? So, uh, and so some that come to mind are uh, David, uh, well, no, Beth Jesos, um, that's what he goes by. Um, and there's a very famous uh, YouTuber uh, named uh, David Shapiro, who's been doing excellent uh, presentations on YouTube about artificial intelligence and the need to transition to a post labor economy. And I highly recommend his videos. They're, they're very, very good. There's some very interesting things that, um, that I, that I like to talk about that he, he, he mentions in his latest video. So he, David Shapiro, it's very interesting because he believes that we are about to, um, we're, we're going to experience a hard takeoff, which is essentially what, um, it's like the, 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 uh, what some people call as the singularity right? That there's going to be like a zero to one phase. And at the same time, at the same time, he is uh, very optimistic about what AI will bring. Now, um, feel free to cut me off if you ever, ever, you know, if you have any, uh, anything to yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I get, so the thing, okay, so whenever I hear about the singularity, 
Um, cause basically, as I understand it, it means exponential rate of improvement in, in AI, um, efficiency. And I, I get the concept. I just don't, I haven't heard what is their argument for being sure that that is, is possible. Like the concept makes sense. Okay. You get something that can make a better version of itself. So it'll always get better, but. It, uh, yeah. So where, it, well, how are they so sure that that is, is possible? Yeah. So it's interesting. David, uh, he, he talks about, um, diminishing returns and natural limitations. So that would be what would be like, a, mm, slowing that down, right? It, it would, that would lead to a progressive takeoff or a slow takeoff or, or not even a takeoff, right? Like you just, um, we just, you know, improve in general our productivity and, uh, that'd be it. Right. Um, and there are, so he, he, he outlines some diminishing returns and natural limitations like energy, like uh, compute power, uh, and things like that. Um, and other possible ones that are possible, um, like collection of data and it's really interesting, but then he believes that the compounding returns, uh, are going to overcome that and the quantum leaps. Like he believes that there are going to be significant quantum leaps and by quantum leaps, he, he uses a different term, but what he means is that, um, like there are moments where there's like a zero to a one, like if for instance, uh, fusion energy were discovered, right. Mm -hmm. Or, or quantum computing would, w would exist. Right. So those are like quantum leaps in which all our capacity is greatly improved and um and then right so that would that would more than compensate the natural limitations and diminishing return problem okay hmm. yeah um I, okay but but again well the quantum computing um i actually want to i think um beth jesus uh he from what I remember him explaining, he's, he's one of the most important accelerationists, right? Mm -hmm. And I think he used to work on quantum computing. Yes, and, he did. Yeah. And I, from what I understood, he, he, he sort of realized that it's, it's not that easy as it, I, I think from what I understood, he, he thinks it's not as promising as some people make it out to be. He thinks the big leap will be in other areas. And again, quantum computing is one of those things that, yeah, if, well, from what I understand correctly, like quantum computing, if it works, it would also break all of crypto and it would break because then it would be possible to to hack any uh, anything. Well, uh, there. OK, so some people are concerned about that, but um, other people explain why there there isn't much concern um, because it, it would. Well, before breaking crypto, they'd break all sorts of other things so that, you know, they'd hack into all sorts of, uh, you know, um, defense systems and all sorts of other systems um, that are that are more important and more valuable than than crypto is right so um, and crypto could easily upgrade to uh, solve that that's what I understand but um, I see what you're saying that you don't really think that the quantum leaps are are that significant well that no no I, I guess or, so, or probable so I think when you look at quantum leaps um, in history, in the advance of technology, um, yeah, there have been, but I think it's very hard to predict what impact they will have. So the here he's saying that the quantum leaps will, um, so a quantum leap here, what is it, in computer science or in, in, in different anything? Things. Yeah, yeah, like there are different things in which there could be quantum leaps. But yeah. For instance, if there's a quantum leap in... Um, for instance, in, in energy, right? So for instance, if fusion were possible, hmm. then the amount of energy, you know, there'd be, there'd be almost unlimited energy and that would allow like a lot more compute. There would be like no limitation to that. Well, yeah, I got, actually, so I think what happens though, is that it's just very difficult. It's hard enough to know, to sort of make science advance, um, within a current paradigm. But if you try to imagine what will happen in a future quantum leap, it just it just becomes a lot more speculative. It's the the, the problems you'll find and the solutions. Uh, I just think it's very hard to to sort of forecast that. Hmm. Um, and I, what I see here is I see it as sort of like he used to say, okay, 
like a like he just sees it as a unidirectional kind of thing um and that will just help ai i mean okay yeah i i, I get that i get it i understand that yeah, yeah, and he also thinks that there's it, compounding returns. So, like, the more artificial intelligence there is, the more everything everything can progress. And it's not necessarily artificial intelligence that is creating new artificial intelligence, but it's helping us in all the other processes. So, like, in collecting data and, um, yeah. But what I find uh, fascinating is that, and a bit concerning, actually, is that he... He considers himself to be an optimist, right? He, he believes that AI will most likely bring about like a, a much better, you know, uh, humanity and society. But he also believes that there's a 20 to 30 percent chance of doom. And I think that I think that there's like unless unless you 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 like are coming from a place of despair and you're trying to balance that you're trying to balance despair being optimistic with a 20 to 30 percent chance of doom for the entire planet or all of humanity is not is not sane like I, yeah I think it seems crazy yeah right like it, yeah. so what and, and what that reminds me of right so what it makes me think of is that um a lot like the reason why people are optimistic or pessimistic, I think, is greatly influenced by their personal situation, right? So, um, you know, David Shapiro and Beth Jesos, they are, uh, you know, they're, they're doing very well uh, today, right? They, they, they have, you know, great jobs. They're, they're very satisfied with their job. Um, you know, they're living in, in, in safe countries and safe areas. And... Um, and and so this the the the, gen, the system today has benefited them, and so I think that automatically makes you be like unconsciously you're you're, you're optimistic even though you know rationally you 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 shouldn't be right because I, yeah. you, and I think that that's that is one of the situations that we're seeing and, and we have to really keep that in mind. Hmm. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I okay. So for, for me, it reminds me a little bit of of. And some years ago, they were they were saying that they were going to sequence the human genome, which they did, and that this would allow curing all of the diseases um, that humans had, mm -hmm. and that it would also allow. Um, it would be very dangerous because it would be allow. Um, yeah, you know, like that movie Gataka. It would it would uh, usher in an era of all these ethical problems where you could have these people that are genetically very um, altered, and it and it. I, I I'm not saying those things aren't aren't problems, but it they've sequenced the human genome, and the, it it didn't happen. Like there wasn't there wasn't a huge breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And I and again I I don't want to sound just just pessimistic on these things because mm -hmm. i but i do think that sometimes things are just more complicated than than they might seem like i i feel like a lot of these ai people these tech people they feel like they've got it all figured out that that sort of intelligence is competition. yeah well so I, I think one of the reasons why they do feel that way is because that's kind of like what it's it's an it's an asset for them to think that way for their job and to get funding etc Right. Which is something that's interesting because that's one thing that Beth Jesus points out. Like he's very open about the fact that he is optimistic as a like as a premise. And he believes that pessimism is is destructive, um, like just um, like always like it, like it's just very, very destructive and dangerous to be pessimistic. And so um, and he says specifically that that the optimism is like something that helps companies, startups actually achieve a lot. And, and there's, there is a point to that. Right. Um, but yeah, it's weird because in this case, the optimism, it sort of turns into pessimism because, because they're so optimistic about the potential of, of AI that they're, that then it, makes them think that it would be so powerful that it would just destroy the world. Well, no. Okay. So Beth Jesos and David Shapiro, Shapiro, they actually, they're optimistic, right? Beth Jesos, 
he's like a fanatic and and I think that he he's forgetting a lot of things like like he it's weird because he he considers consumption of energy to be the best measurement of progress and I think that, that is clearly not the case because you know we just have to look at what happened to Easter Island you know so um he is very openly a believer in the present system that it just improves everything and capital is the best way to measure someone's contribution to society and so um and so logically right he is such an accelerationist because into artificial intelligence is just accelerating you know everything that's what it does it accelerates the present system and i think that the present system is actually um destroying the the the, the environment and um and and destroying us in many ways and i think that uh accelerating it is 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 extremely dangerous and this is what like the point that i that i think is very important to get across is that um unless we understand what our goal is as a society it's it you know we're just going to rush off a cliff right hmm yeah it well that's it seems to me that they're so so they believe basically that advancing in technology is inevitable they believe that it's also all powerful and so in a way and they believe that that's what they have to do and if not they won't do it someone else will and well if you think about if you just 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 look at it psychology psychologically let's say they they seem obsessed basically with um with 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 technology basically if you compare them to other mm-hmm. sectors of the population now i'm not saying they're wrong right mm-hmm. but um but uh, i mean i i yeah i don't know up to what point and then but it, and again, again when you start looking at them it 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 even seems insane in the sense that they're ready to participate in this kind of race that they think is probably going to doom the planet um yeah, it, it, well, at some point... Well, they think that there's a possibility, like in, in David's, you know, um, situation, like he believes that there's a very significant possibility that, uh, you know, it's going to destroy everything. And he still is, you know... Well, he actually believes that there's no way to slow it down. Like, we just, it just can't. So, so he could be dealing with... Well, he's Partially not... dealing with, um, you know, um, fear, partially, you know, coping with that. And... Um, partially partially just you know reflecting his his well-being today you know like i said earlier hmm. yeah well he's not directly involved uh, uh, as i understand in the research or no no he this. isn't no no i mean he so he's talking about it and maybe like educating people about it yeah and maybe um that can help it accelerate and so on and he is concerned about it, you know things going wrong so that's why he's educating about it right so he you know and when, I, fair, and when I downplay it, I don't mean I think AI can do a lot, right? And there could be a lot of risks and so on. It's just that the the I think and and I and I'm I'm sure there's other people like that, right? But but I just uh, I would like to hear, yeah, okay. The the I'm just a bit skeptic about the when it goes into basically where like um, God territory because it, yeah. they're so obsessed with it. And then they say it's like all powerful. It's going to destroy everything. It starts, it, it, you know, it starts to get. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. So I so sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it, start, starts it starts to get, I don't know, like a religion or a cult or something, you know? Yeah. It's, well, okay. So very it's interesting. So Beth Jesus actually openly says that he, he, for him, accelerationism is a religion. Right. Okay. Like he, 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 he says it very clearly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I find interesting, um, is that, um, and uh, concerning, right, is that both Beth Jesus and David Shapiro, they, they set a very simple objective as like, what is good? Like, so Beth Jesus says that what's good is consumption of energy, which is, I think, uh, insane. And then David Shapiro says that what we should be aiming for is understanding. And I think that understanding, like... So there's there's reason why I think that that's not a good enough aim, which is that basically understanding could be in like in every direction. And we see that today, right? We see that there are a lot of things that we have understood for a long time and that science has done very good work on, which for instance, like the science of uh, of human needs. 
um, which we're going to talk a little bit later if we can. Um, and it's just completely ignored. Like there's a lot of stuff that is just completely ignored and it's not really pursued. And so I think it's similar in this case. It's like, okay, understanding. So you're pursuing understanding, but of what, right? And, and so right now we have the understanding of what human needs are for people to be healthy and sane, right? Or, or a beginning of that. And, and we have to incorporate that right away. Cause if not, then we're just ignoring the understanding that we have. Right. So it, it you know, you can't just make it a simple metric like 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 that simple, um, because you know you're, you're missing out what the actually the, the the understanding that you've actually made. Yeah. So another interesting thing that I find is uh, so I think a good way to frame this. So before we get onto the what we believe or what I believe is a solution, um, and I think it's a very effective solution. Um, is so one of the things that both David and Eliza um, do understand uh, is the Moloch problem, and Beth Jesus does not at all. Like he doesn't, he doesn't even believe it exists. Um, which is the Moloch problem is is ex like there are many different ways to talk about the Moloch problem. Moloch is like the name of a god, um, and um, live um, live Bori uh, popularized this this idea. Um, which is that it's a way to en encompass um, the problem of also called uh, you know mutually assured destruction or the the multipolar trap, the race to the bottom. It's also um, what people understand as game theory, the need to align as incentives. It's also the tragedy of the commons is also another form of this problem. Uh, the arms race is a form of this problem, and it's essentially so the. Basically, I think none of these people are actually uh, um, realizing this, but essentially the problem is that we're forced to sacrifice the long-term good for the short-term gain so that we can get ahead in the competition for resources. Um, so it's, it's interesting because this is something that more and more people are aware of, um, but still a lot of people are not aware of. Um, or they're aware of it, but they just choose to ignore it because they don't really know what to do, I guess. Um, and anyway, so, so when, when we realize that that's the problem, right, which is a very easily formulated pro like description of the problem, it's, it's sacrificing the long-term good for the short-term gain, and that we have to do that. We have to do that because we are in a competition for resources for survival, right? So... This, um, the solution is very simple when we see it that way. It's a, to end the competition for resources, the, to end the competition for survival. And it's, it's interesting that um, it, what I find interesting is that no one is coming to this conclusion. Like, it, it, I feel like some people are, they, they, they have kind of started to see it, but they're, kind of they're kind of afraid to say it because it changes the paradigm completely right it, it it changes our paradigm it changes the basic assumption that people have to earn their living right and that's kind of like all our society is is structured that way and there is this there is this um so this is an association with uh the, the end of that idea, right, with communism, which is like, um, you know, which is the end of our rights as an individual um, and also um, like the, the um, kind of the, the, the other problem that people always talk about with communism, which I believe is true, is that when, when power is centralized so much, uh, we lose the, 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 um, the emergent intelligence of humanity as a whole with all of us, you know, um, making decisions uh, within our own situations and that, we, that only us understand the situation that we're in. And, um, and so it's, you know, instead of having billions of minds working, when power is centralized, there's only like a few minds working, you know, maybe a hundred minds working. And, and that... Um, and also I think what happens then is that there's too much, um, there's misalignment because, because 
um, the, the incentives and the objectives are no longer aligned because when it's only a few minds that have control, then it, their incentives are their own, right? Mm -hmm. Their, yeah. their objectives are their own and it's not, it doesn't necessarily correspond. They don't, they're not necessarily the same ones as everyone else. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I fully agree that, uh, you know, that we have to avoid that, but that doesn't mean that we can't, and we, and we, and we don't have to, like, that doesn't mean that, that, that we, we, we can't end the competition for resources and we can't end the need to earn a living. Um, because I think that's this, that's, that's what we have to do. Like we, we just, there's no way around it. Yeah. I don't know if you want to, you want to say something to that. Uh, sorry. Well, there was a, a lot of things. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess, so for me, with with the whole arms race thing, and, and this, yeah, it's very much related to the AI thing, because once they start, um, they they see themselves as in a system, just like if it was the Cold War, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then they need to build more faster, stronger weapons than the enemies are, except that they're not the military. They're, they're AI tech companies. But but all of a sudden, they're, every time it's like if they're seeing themselves more as if they were that, right? Mm -hmm. And so they're just slipping, changing roles. Like in a very, I don't know, they're sort of like slipping into that role. I don't know if they're totally aware of that, but it's a big shift. Um, you mean they're like just, they're, 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 they're people that are working in technology and now they're taking the role of working in in weapons industry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And they, I don't, I don't know if they, they they talk about it like that, and they sounding more and more like that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if they, I don't know if they've realized this or if they, yeah, I don't know if they're self aware of, of that in that sense. Like, um, because right, what would the next step be? I mean, I guess they believe that it's more efficient to work as. But then they're sort of sounding like if they're independent, uh, company-owned, private-owned military the technology, right? I, I don't know. I, um, yeah, I, I just think it's interesting. I wonder what they would think about that. But I, because um, I, I think a lot of people that go into tech, they're thinking about how to improve the world mm -hmm. and how to fix problems, solve problems. You know, an engineer mindset. You know, you solve problems, you improve the lives of people, and so on. Um, and and you know, you get rewarded for that. Hmm. But that's a very different idea than thinking about like defense, like national defense or, you know, uh, fighting against enemies. It's a different uh, right. uh, mentality or goals, you know, and, and um, yeah, th that they just sort of slip into that because um, because with the whole arms race thing, that's been something that that, you know, politically people have been talking about uh, for a while. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I also think it's kind of a cop out, right? Because they're just allowing themselves to continue. It's just the same old cop out as always. It's like, well, if someone else doesn't, if I don't do it, someone else will, right? And so it's just a cop out to like allow themselves to continue doing whatever they want, basically. Well, it's what the military says, too. Right, right, right. It's, right, it's the right. same thing. It's just, yeah. So you, you wanted to talk about uh, laws of robotics, but I think we're running out of time. So I, I would like to just go into uh, just a little bit. Um, do you have a, a, like 10 minutes or something? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So basically I just wanted to talk a little more about this, like how we solve this, right? So how do we, how do we end the need to earn a living, right? Without giving government full control over our lives? Well, essentially we, we just have to raise awareness about uh, how important it is for to, to, to align everybody, to, to align our goals. And, and that's how we achieve um, AI alignment. You know, we can't achieve AI alignment without achieving human alignment first, right? It's just, it's just impossible, right? So, and the only way that we can achieve human alignment is like I said earlier, is that, is it that we end the competition for resources, right? And how do we do that? We accept the fact that we need to take care of everybody, absolutely everybody. And this, there, there are, there's another way to reach that, and this is what I think is the most effective way to bring about this change, is, um, is raising awareness about human needs. And so that's how we can understand what our goal is as humanity. What does it mean to take care of other people, right? So um, basically, what, what it means, is it means satisfying their needs and, or helping satisfy their needs. And 
this is okay. So I think the important part is this this concept, right? There's there's a the concept of human needs um, is is absolutely necessary, and most people don't have this concept yet. Basically, uh, the idea of a human need is that it's necessary, right? And what that means is that without it, if it's not satisfied, people will develop pathologies. Right? And so what happens when people develop pathologies? Well, they become either mentally or physically ill. What happens when people become mentally or physically ill? They become a burden or a danger to everyone around them. So once we understand that, it's no longer like um, an obligation um, to take care of everybody. It's something, it's, it's something that we, we understand that it's in our benefit, right? So, so that's how we solve this problem. Um, and then once people understand that, we can, in a decentralized fashion, just like we're doing now, without giving away our freedoms, because it happened, it, it, freedom is a fundamental human need, that without which we will develop pathologies. And that's why it's so important. Um, and we don't have to give up any of our freedom in order for everyone to be uh, fully satisfied and have all their needs met unconditionally. We just have to understand that that is necessary. And um, so you, so there are different, there are different um, like uh, models of human needs, right? But th this, th this is a definition that I think is, is, is the basic key. Because once we understand the definition, which is that it's, it, it's required for us to not have uh, developed pathologies and that everyone has the same needs. What changes is how we satisfy them. Once we, once we accept that framework, then we can use the methods of science to, to understand better what our needs are. And um, well, I was hoping to talk about this, but I guess we'll talk about it in the next program, uh, which are, uh, you know, research that's been done on this and how um, emotional needs are um, are absolutely biologically necessary. Um, they're, they're, they're not just something that we can overcome with an effort and, you know, um, stoicism. Um, and then there, there are different frameworks, but you've always been a fan of, uh, of, of the human givens framework, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I think when we talk about human needs, uh, it might be useful to just have a bit of perspective in terms of, of science. Um, psychology in general is relatively young. It's a relatively young science, and it's also um, it's it's progressed, but it, it's been difficult progress also because what it's studying is very complex and, and very complicated, and and it's it, it's so close to who we are that I think it also it, there's more biases involved. There can be political biases or all sorts of biases that can make it also harder to to just study in a sort of objective way. Other than it's complex and and the biases, right? And um, but I think and and going back to what you said before about just increasing understanding, I think that in psychology there has been an increase of understanding, but but part of what Part of the problem or the potential uh, that there is is that that understanding hasn't necessarily been assimilated by uh, society, right? And and mm -hmm. this is sort of what we're talking about, right? Right. Yeah. right. <clears throat> so um, it, it 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 because it isn't uh, it, it's so sorry. What's the word? Um, it, it, it's. It's it's not in people's interest necessarily. Like it's it's convenient for them to not consider that, right? And to, and to ignore it. Yeah. Well. Well. Because it's again. So since it's so the, um, as a study, since you're studying yourself, right? It's this like this idea of an anthropologist that's studying some other tribe, um, and he might talk about taboos and all sorts of um, things he might study, and then. And then he might go back to his own tribe or his own society and not be able to see those same things. And, and maybe detecting those things or talking about those things would be against the interests of some, himself or herself or other parts of that society or certain institutions or just um, uncomfortable. Right? Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, what's very clear is that, you know, having to accept the responsibility of taking care of everybody else on the planet is a big burden, right? Like, 
And so it's understandable that people are, try, are trying to avoid that as much as possible. Um, right. I mean, it's know. a big burden, but it's not something that an individual does. Like, I feel, I, I feel like it's a big burden, but it also somehow just also fits in with, with um, maybe just older or traditional um, or more intuitive ideas of what morality is and what um, people should, should do to help the people around them, right? I think that the difficulty is when, because um, you're thinking that what well, people think of it as, as the whole world, right? But, it, but if before all the communication and, and transport was so easy, um, the idea of maybe helping the people around you wasn't that radical possibly, you know, because, uh-huh. and maybe acting, helping all the people, um, that you are involved with, you know, and having a certain standard of, of not hurting anyone you're involved with and so on. That's it. To, to me, those kinds of things, they, they are sort of a part, maybe there's cynicism, maybe there's, you know, but they're, they're sort of a part of our legal system and our, our legal systems and our moral systems. In a way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. So like the, the fiduciary responsibility to maximize profit for shareholders, for instance. Right. And, and I also think that, um, it's, it's ingrained in our system when we are, we are de facto in, you know, in a death match against everybody else because we're in competition for resources, we're in competition for clients, we're in competition for jobs, right? And that's like on a, a smaller scale, but it's still real, right? It's still real if you, if you, uh, if, if you lose your job to someone else because you are being, um, you know, you're spending too much time with your family, for instance, or something like that, right? You lose your job and that can s- scale downwards and you can, and you can fall down um, progressively uh, but you 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 can snowball down into a situation where you are excluded from uh, the capacity to have your fundamental human needs satisfied, especially. And that's something that people like. If you see p- human needs as just food and water, then you don't really understand that. Which is why I think it's so important to raise awareness also about emotion, like fundamental emotional needs, because because. They're real, right? They're real. And so what happens is that if you, you lose your job to someone else or you lose clients and you lose, you know, and you slowly get out of the loop, well, that's, you know, you can, you can get in a situation where you're not satisfying your needs. And so you want to avoid that at all costs. And so you can't be, you, you can only be concerned about the short term game, which is what we're, you know, like I was saying, you're like, we're, we, we don't have a choice. You know, in the system that we're in now. So it's like this, it's like this feedback, this negative feedback loop, which some people are calling like the race to the bottom, right? Yeah. So I, th- I think you need to go. Yeah, I think that's a good maybe okay. uh, note to end on. And uh, we can continue okay. on in, in the next episode. <laughs> okay, so thanks everyone for listening. Uh, please uh, look up prosocialize.org. Look at the, uh, the, the, the links below and tell us what you, what you thought about this conversation. Um, we, we would love to, to see your comments. So thank you and uh, just keep raising awareness about fundamental human needs. <laughs> uh, enjoy a shared world.